today. Thank you, Annika. And then our pastor, David, will bring us the message for this morning. Today's Bible reading comes from Deuteronomy 5, and the Bible pages are just on the screen. So, Deuteronomy 5. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. At that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days ye shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it ye shall not do any work, Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest, as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness. And he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When he heard the voice out of the darkness while the mountain was ablaze with fire, All the leading men of your tribes and your elders came to me. And you said, The Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a man can live even if God speaks with him. But now why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal man has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. The Lord heard you when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Go, tell them to return to their tents. But you stay here with me so that I may give you all the commands, decrees and laws, and you are to teach them to follow in the land I am giving them to possess. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's open our Bibles. Just to let you know, in the uh, bulletin there's an outline. Some of it is a mistake that I've made on the numbering of some of the verses, but you won't get lost, I don't think. But let's pray as we come to God's word. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning. Indeed, we come to the mountain. We come to hear your voice speaking to us from out of the fire, the fire of your holiness, your majesty and your grace. We pray this morning, Father, that you would give us ears to hear, that we might know you better and love you more and worthily magnify your holy name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was once an expert of the law who asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And it is an excellent question. And Jesus answered, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well, in giving us this summary of the whole counsel of God, Jesus also gave us the key to the inner workings of the Ten Commandments. Love God and love your neighbour. Commandments 1 through 4, love God. Commandments 5 through 10, love your neighbour. They are all about love. Our first duty of love is toward God. But our second duty of love is toward our neighbour. Therefore, love God and love your neighbour, both together, never alone. Well said, teacher. The man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that the man had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. I love that part of Mark's Gospel. You'll find it in chapter 12 if you want to go home and look at it. You are not far from the kingdom of God. You have answered well. Today, friends, we are looking at one of the most important passages in the Bible, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the centrepiece of God's covenant with Israel, the Old Covenant. And it's actually the constitution of the nation. It spells out the meaning of love in ten practical ways, as we heard in the kids' talk, that God wants us to follow and obey. This is how God wants us to live. You see, each commandment is like a lane marking on the road of life to keep you and your family safe as you travel along the way with God. So listen up, obey God's word, keep his commandments, enjoy the ride. Today's passage reminds me of that special day when your dad gives you the keys to the car for the very first time. I wonder if you've had that experience. It's a, it's a major moment. You know what I mean? Dad is letting you drive his car for the first time. Wow. And he says, now listen, young man, listen, young woman, I expect you to drive safely. Don't take any silly risks. Don't break the speed limit. Don't cross the double lines. Drive safely because I love you. Do you understand? I love you. And because I love you, I want you to drive safely and enjoy a long and happy life. Listen to this from verse 32 at the end of our passage. You see, this is where we're heading. Moses says in conclusion... So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. 
Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. So God is getting out the keys, saying, I love you, drive carefully. It's a milestone moment in the life of Israel. In fact, we're witnessing the birth of Israel as a nation, their coming of age, if you will. All Israel has been assembled together in the presence of God to hear their constitution read out and to renew the covenant by promising before God to listen and obey. To listen and obey. So we have these ten words to live by, which we call the Ten Commandments given by God to Israel to constitute them into a holy nation, a kingdom of priests under God's rule and blessing. This is the second time, isn't it, that God's people have heard these words. You may know the first time was 40 years earlier at Mount Sinai at Horeb, which you can read about in Exodus chapter 20 if you want to do that. You'll see that the Ten Commandments were given previously. Uh, But this is the next generation. That first generation kind of crashed it in the driveway, as it were, without even getting into first gear. They perished in the desert because of their unbelief. And there's no doubt that Moses' speech in our passage today in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is influenced by those unhappy events as he is now speaking to the second generation and wishing them well and calling them to obedience, to walk in his commandments and obey him. We are witnessing a covenant renewal ceremony. God is saying, <laughs> let's try that again, shall we? Let's try that again. Let's renew the promises and recommit ourselves to this covenant relationship that we are in. So in verse 1, Moses is speaking, you will notice to, who is he speaking to? All Israel. Do you see that in the Bible in verse 1? I hope you've got your Bible open. It's great to have your Bible open and follow God's word. Even to those who are not yet born. All Israel, you, your children, your children's children after you. And this may seem odd to us, but there is a timelessness to this covenant relationship. Israel as a nation includes everyone who is or ever will be an Israelite. So the promises made by the parents are meant to be passed on and renewed by the children and allows this allows the identity of Israel as a nation to live on through time as that banner is passed from one generation to the next and they gather and they hear the word of God explained and applied to their lives and they make those covenant commitments generation by generation. In the church today we do something similar I think with baptism and confirmation. Uh, Your mum and dad make promises on your behalf if you're baptised as a child. But then the day comes when you as a child must own your faith as an adult. And so at that point we, we ask you to confirm your faith by renewing your covenant promises before God and by taking on that Christian life for yourself. That's kind of what confirmation is. It's a covenant renewal ceremony for children who have been born and blessed and raised in the church. So Israel gathers in the presence of God to renew the covenant as one body, one people, one nation united together in the bonds of love. And you'll notice this is not one law for the rich and another for the poor. And this is not one law for the men and another law for the women. And this is not one law for the adults and another one for the kids. No, this is one law for all Israel, for all God's people, all for one and one for all. And it's so uniting. It brings them together. It identifies them and unites them, I believe, to Christ in faith in God's word. It's one law for all Israel. So let's listen now to the start of Moses' speech. I'm looking again, as I said, verse 1. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and the laws I declare to you in your hearing today. And what is he expecting them to do? Well, it's in verse 2. Learn them. Do you know the Ten Commandments? 
Ah, over there, good. <laughs> you know, are they in here? Are they in here? Do you know the Ten Commandments? Do you know the Second Commandment? No idols. Do you know the Tenth Commandment? Don't covet. What's the Fourth Commandment? No, you don't know. Verse 2. Okay, if you do nothing else today, you will take verse 2 as an application point. And you will come back next week. You'll say to me, I've learnt the Ten Commandments and I'm beginning to learn them for my head and my heart. Learn them and, oh, there's more. Be sure to follow them. If only I'd have taken that advice from my dad, I might not have run a policeman off the road at 110 kilometres an hour in a 60 zone, which I did do and got in trouble. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. And every time these words are being read, I believe that those Israelites who had gathered at that time are being called to just unite together, as it were, to to imagine themselves, to, to sense that they are present with the Lord at Sinai and these words are being spoken to you, to us who are alive here today. So I believe that God's word speaks to us across the ages, to all generations, allowing every one of us, all people, to hear his voice speak to us today. His voice can speak to us today. From his word. You see, the Bible is not just another book. The Bible is living and active. It is God's holy scripture. It is God's word. It is the voice of God. The Bible reads us as we read it. That Jesus himself is the word made flesh. What does that tell you about Jesus? What does that tell you about this passage? The word of God made flesh. And so we believe in the power of preaching. That when God's word is faithfully preached, his voice can be truly heard in the midst of the congregation because it's the word of God from his word communicated to us today. But if you don't read the Bible, how can you know God? If you don't know the Ten Commandments, how do you you know how he wants you to live? You just make up your own ethics, I presume, and do what you think is best. The only trustworthy revelation of God is found in his word, in the Bible. So this is a real test of your faith. Do you trust God and do you believe in the Bible? Jesus taught his disciples exactly the same thing. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. The sheep listen to the shepherd's voice. Are you listening to God? God's people listen to their shepherd. They listen to God's word as it's preached and of course they read God's word for themselves. And so God speaks to us, to us who are here alive today by his word. God is speaking to you. Can you hear him? I believe this with all my heart. I believe in the God who speaks to us today. And this is what he's saying to us now. In verse 6, do you hear him? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the first of the Ten Commandments. But today I'm looking at the first four together since they all together teach us how to love God. So, first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Second, you shall not make for yourself an idol. 
Third, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And fourth, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Let's bring these four together this morning. Of course, each of these commandments really deserves a sermon on its own, doesn't it? There's so much we could say here. But this morning, I just want you to remember, I want you to see, I want you to hear about the glory and the goodness of your God, the Lord God, who brought you out of the land of slavery and I want your heart to be moved. I want your heart to be delighted in this God, your God. Behold your God who speaks. Just stop for a moment and consider what your God has done for you. He's called you out of bondage to sin. He has loved you in Jesus Christ. He's revealed himself to you. He has rescued you, cared for you, clothed you in his righteousness and he has promised himself to you. How great is our God. I want you to look again at verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And what does this mean for us today? I think it means we better not muck around. If the Lord is God, follow him. If the Lord is God, obey him. Yes, we know it's hard, we know it's impossible actually to get it perfect, but it doesn't take away the obligation, the responsibility, the duty to hear the commandment and to seek to live it out. You know, your boss at work, he's not your God. Your parents however good or indifferent your parents may be, they're not your God. Your children, neither are they your God and neither is your own heart your God. Who is your God? Are you listening to him this morning? There is only one God and he says, you shall have no other gods before me. And now here is something to be concerned about. Did you know the first commandment has actually been banned in China because it contradicts the policy of President Xi Jinping? I've got the uh, actual quotation up here. Who who dares not to cooperate, said an official. If anyone doesn't agree, they are fighting against the country. This is a national policy, he continued. You should have a clear understanding of the situation. Don't go against the government. Ooh. How extraordinary. President Xi Jinping has heard the first commandment. Good. I think he probably understands it better than most Christians do. Good. That's why he hates it. Bad. A very dangerous situation is now developing in China. Do you understand what is happening in our world? The generals in China have been told about a year ago to start preparing for war. They are mobilising in China. And the Christians are first in the firing line. So which will it be? Will I have no other gods before me, as the Lord says, or no other gods before she? That's the president, perhaps the emperor of China wants. Well, you can't choose on a matter like this, can you? The Lord alone is God and there is no other. And so we must pray for our brothers and sisters in China and, yes, in Hong Kong. We must pray for them. Pray that either God turns the president's heart to Jesus or removes him entirely from office. Take him away. Second, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Well, we just talked about the death trap of idolatry last week, so today I just want to note it again here, point out to you the absolute importance of not confusing the creator with creation. We don't bow down to images of people or animals or we don't bow down to the sun and the moon and the stars because the Lord is the creator of all things and we can know him from his word so we need to look for him there. 
Next comes the third commandment, which you could say is about the right use of language. Don't misuse your tongue. Don't dishonour God with your lips. Don't use God's name as a swear word or as an easy oath that you don't really mean to keep. Be careful how you speak about God. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. The fourth commandment is about the right use of time. One of our deepest needs as human beings is for rest. Without rest, our bodies and our minds turn to sludge. We lose the ability to think clearly. We we lose the ability to function. We become tired and irritable and bad-tempered and grumpy. And yes, we suffer spiritually as well. That's why God has commanded us to rest. It is for our good. Even drivers on the road are told to take rest breaks, aren't they? There must be a reason for that. I wonder what it is. If you keep driving without taking rest breaks, people fall asleep at the wheel, don't they? Same in the spiritual life. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Holy, put it aside. Make it different from the rest of your week. Make God the focus of what you think and do on that day and rest. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Turn your computer off. Turn your phone off. Oh, <laughs> Really? Yeah, really. The word Sabbath means rest. That's what it means. It means spiritual, emotional, physical rest. It means stop what you're doing and focus on God. For as God rested on the seventh day after all his work of creation, so we must rest from our work too. It is a foretaste of heaven. It gets you back into the real world even. Smell the roses of spring. You know, seasons changed out there. In our, in our backyard, the cherry blossoms are out. It's very pretty. Look around you though at the streets of Burwood and weep. Even on a Sunday, almost every shop is open. The supermarkets are buzzing with people. The streets are choking with cars. People are rushing from place to place. It's just another day. No different from any other. Not how God intended. I was reading a book about a missionary who went to the Vanuatu in the 1800s. Uh, he was working with the, with their, with the uh, natives over there and brought an entire island of them to Christ. And it's a wonderful story. But when he came back to the Western countries like Australia, he went over to America, <laughs> he was horrified that already at that time, the 1800s, people were treating the Sabbath just like any other day. So when he was offered a ride to go from, the, from, from one place to another, it was a Sabbath day, he said, no, I'll walk. And they were stunned. He wouldn't even hire a taxi in those days to get him from one place to another because he didn't want to deprive taxi drivers of their Sabbath rest. Well, not many Christians think that way these days, but it's here in the passage and I think it's a challenge for us in our restless world. We need to face up to an inconvenient truth that we are all squandering our God-given gift of rest. As Christians, we have surrendered willingly to the tyranny of a restless world and we've taken on a set of values that when you read the Ten Commandments, you realise we're out of step with God. We're out of step with God. We've forgotten the Sabbath day to keep it holy and we are paying for it. So that briefly is what God asks of us in relation to himself. I'm going to move quickly through the rest of the commandments, the second part of the commandments in relation to how to love your neighbour. The fifth commandment, verse 16 says, Honour your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Well, the fifth commandment gives us a clear biblical basis for a moral society. Where does a moral society begin? It begins with a family under God's blessing and care, a dad, a mum and their kids together, a real family unit is the building block of a healthy society. So parents, guard your families because families are under attack in our culture. And remember the state does not own your children. They are a gift from God placed into your care to be raised up in the knowledge and love of God. 
What a blessing then it is to be parents of children who know and love the Lord. Children who honour Christ and seek to follow him. Godly children are a blessing to their family, a blessing to their church and I believe a blessing to their nation. If we get this right, then the whole community is blessed. If we get this wrong, everyone suffers. Next in verse 17, you shall not murder, you shall not kill. This, by this commandment, I learn that God wants me to guard and protect the lives of those around me. He wants me to control my heart and my hands and my tongue as well so that I don't cause hurt or harm to others, either by my words or by my actions. And what about abortion? What about euthanasia? What about suicide? Well, are these covered by the sixth commandment? Yes, I believe they are. We must not kill the unborn child, nor the elderly, nor the infirm, nor even ourselves. Unless, for example, there are times a mother's life is at risk, there are some exceptions where we live in a fallen world, we need to choose the lesser of those difficult choices so that we may need to save a mother. In order to to do that, we may need to have an abortion. But apart from that, we take the presumption that we seek to save life and not to destroy it. That's the very essence of that commandment. If you're struggling with this, maybe you've had an abortion or you know someone who has, please remember that there is a fountain of forgiveness that flows from the cross of Jesus. We saw the movie Unplanned last week and I was really touched. There was a scene in the movie, there was a great wall of flowers and every flower represented the life of a child that had not been born because it had been aborted. And so you had this fence and it was lined with red and white roses put there by mothers who had been carrying this guilt for years and they were now able to publicly mourn and repent and be forgiven and start to heal. And it was a very wonderful scene actually. I wonder if we could do something similar at our church, not only for our people but for perhaps the public as well. That seems to me such a real need in our society, such a silent, unspoken grief and pain. Well, it needs some thought, I know, but it seems to me we need to do something if we're going to be demonstrating against abortion as we are today. What can we do positively? How can we do something constructive to bring the peace of Christ to those who are carrying that burden? Now, the seventh commandment. Yes, we need to think about that as elders and as a church. Seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. That's another lesson our society seems hell-bent on ignoring. So much misery is caused when this commandment is broken. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. And yet we're all lawbreakers, every single one of us. We're all capable of robbing, thieving, being dishonest. Commandment number nine, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. In other words, don't spread gossip or rumours about other people. Guard your tongue, be careful what you say. Don't lie, don't embellish the truth and don't remain silent either. If you hear others telling lies or spreading false rumours or just saying the wrong thing, do something about it. If you can, where you can, speak up. Have the courage to defend the good reputation of the innocent who are being falsely accused. I think that's the goal of the ninth commandment. Be careful what you say, how you say it. In all things, speak the truth in love. Finally, in verse 21, the tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, you shall not set your desire on your neighbour's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. You see, covetousness is a form of greed which basically looks over the fence, see what the other people have got and wants it. Why do they have it and I don't? That's not fair. If only I had a wife or a husband so smart, so clever, so shapely, so rich, then I'd be happy. Then I, I could really enjoy my life. Or a new car or design a dress or a bigger house or a younger body. Yes, then I'd be really happy. Even the Apostle Paul had his struggles with sin. He mentions coveting as one sin that he struggled with. He says in Romans chapter 7, I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said do not covet. 
But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And that's the Apostle Paul. See, I think we have to reach a point in reading the Ten Commandments, in listening to what God is saying, just as Derek said in the, in the kids' talk, to realise that this is a, a double-edged sword in a sense. It, it, there is both blessing here, but there is a curse. The law is good. It was given by God so that we might learn how to love God and love our neighbour. And yet because of sin, we always fail. We let one another down, we let God down, we let ourselves down. We just can't do it. Not perfectly. Not as God requires. So the law then brings us, instead of to heaven, it brings us to the point of despair. I just can't do it, Lord. There's nothing I can do that will ever meet your perfect standard. What kind of God are you that expects this of me if I can't do it? And so my pride and my selfishness and my greed is all revealed, our own inner darkness. And if God is really working in your life, that will bring you to tears as you realise how hard you've tried again and again to do the right thing and you can't or just you just can't work it out. A wretched man that I am, says the Apostle Paul, Who will rescue me from this body of death? And he cries out. And then he says in chapter 7, verse 25 of Romans, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the answer. The one and only Son of God who keeps the law to bring me peace with God. Only Jesus can save you from whatever sins that are within you And that's true for all of us, since we all have the same problem. So I might ask you, how have you been driving lately? Hmm? As you've listened to the Ten Commandments, what's God been saying to you? My fourth point is short. I'm going to sum very quickly up now. The problem we all face is that we promise that we will listen and obey, but in fact we don't. We will listen and obey not. Why can't I fix the problem? The answer is because I'm the problem. Sin is more serious than I realise. It's not something that I can just tinker with and make it go away. I'm the problem. And God knows this and our passage today reminds us that he always knew it. So if you look at verse 28, the Lord heard you, this is talking to, to Moses, because they've said, well, how, how can we approach God and, 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 and live? Because we're going to die with, in a relationship like this. Why don't you, Moses, be our mediator and you go between us and God and bring us everything God tells you? And then they say in verse 27, we will listen and obey. And then the Lord says, the Lord heard you when you spoke to me and the Lord said to me, I've heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Notice what it says after that. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and to keep my commandments so that it might go well with them and their children forever. That they might keep my commandments always. See, God knows our problem. He knows our hearts. He knows our need. And he himself has come to supply that need in Christ. Only Jesus can save me. Only he can set me free. I can't do it by myself. My help needs to come from the outside because the problem is within me. I'm the problem. You're the problem. But Jesus is the answer. And so we have hope today. More than mere rules, the Ten Commandments spell out the meaning of love in ten practical ways. They teach us how to live in right relationship with God and with one another. And then they point us to Christ our Saviour who fulfills the law for us even when we fail. And now if you've been driving dangerously, stop and think what you're doing. God already knows what you're up to. 
You can't hide it from him. Come to your senses, turn back to God and drive safely. Verse 32, be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Drive safely, keep between the lines, remember that God loves you and that Jesus is your saviour. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful passage. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you for rebuking us for our complacency. Help us to learn your Ten Commandments and apply them in our lives, knowing that even though we can't keep them, it's pleasing to you that we seek to try, turning always to Jesus who saves us and redeems us and completes and, and, and completely deals with everything that is our inability. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our King and Saviour, who fulfills the law for us, that we might walk with you in joy, in unity and in peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.